supernova explosions are one of the most powerful events in our known universe, the violent death of a star. When a star goes supernova, it radiates a tremendous amount of energy, also releasing the elements that make up our physical bodies. Everything from the iron in our blood to the calcium in our bones have all come from dying stars. In order to better understand ourselves and also the origins of the universe, we want to recreate things such as supernovas in the laboratory using some of the most powerful lasers in the world. Imagine being able to use lasers to recreate a supernova that could fit in the palm of your hands. Today, we're here at the Orion Laser, one of the biggest lasers on Earth. And Colin Danson is one of the creators of this laser. Let me show you around the facility. The Orion Laser can deliver a thousand times the power of the entire U.S. national grid in just a fraction of a second over an area smaller than a strand of hair. Squeezing so much energy into a small amount of time and space allows us to generate megabar pressures found in planetary cores and temperatures up to 10 million degrees. We are now inside the Orion laser, one of the most powerful lasers on Earth. Behind us here are the amplifier stages. Powered from below us, these light bulbs, not much dissimilar to light bulbs you would have at home, are powered here, and the light is taken through each one of the stages of these tubes. As the light travels through each tube, it goes through something called neodymium glass, which allows it to gain more and more energy with every pass that it makes, until they go into the next room and onto target. We're in the Orion laser hall at the heart of the facility and you can see behind me the output beams of some of the laser beam lines delivering energy to target. The optics are special lenses with coatings which are incredibly fragile and expensive and we have to be suited up in these special overalls and gloves to be able to handle the optics and even be in the area. Now the experiment starts. We carefully set up a tiny carbon rod and a gas-filled chamber and align the lasers in diagnostics. Once the target is blown up by the lasers, it drives a strong shockwave into the chamber, mimicking the violent processes found in space. And this is really important because if we want to better understand the universe, the origins of our universe, we want to recreate these kind of astrophysical events on a short time scale. We don't want to wait around thousands of years for events to develop. We want to recreate them within a fraction of a second and have control over all the different dynamics. By recreating these types of supernovas in the laboratory using these large laser facilities, we can better understand astrophysical events in our universe. But more importantly, we can better understand the origins of our universe. Volcanic eruptions exhibit tremendous power. In 2010, over 100,000 flights were grounded when the Icelandic volcano Eyjafjallajökull exploded. It shot ash 35,000 feet into the air. But sometimes molten rock simply flows out of the ground like a river. 
That's what happened in this eruption from Badabunga volcano four years later in Iceland. Not a single flight was cancelled. The Badabunga eruption may not have been as explosive, but it was actually ten times bigger than Eyjafjallajökull. It released the energy of a Hiroshima atomic bomb, not just once, but every two minutes, hour after hour, day after day, month after month, for half a year. At the University of Cambridge, we tracked the underground movement of the molten rock before it erupted, using the 30,000 tiny earthquakes that were produced as it forced its way through the Earth's crust. Students working out in Iceland found themselves in an exciting race using helicopters, snow scooters and four-wheel drives in one of the most rugged areas on Earth, trying to predict where an eruption might occur. The last few seismometers were deployed just hours before the molten rock erupted right in the midst of them, having travelled underground for 46 kilometres from the volcano. Then the race was on again to retrieve the closest seismometer and its valuable data minutes before it was buried by the advancing lava flow. In volcanic systems, molten rock frequently intrudes its way through the Earth's crust. It is difficult to predict when or where it will erupt at the surface and what the impact might be. Our work at the University of Cambridge, studying earthquakes in volcanic systems, helps in understanding the processes leading up to these dramatic events. In 2012, an excavation began with the hope of finding the final resting place of King Richard III. Essentially, it was a historical missing persons case. Richard III was said to have been buried in the Greyfriars Friary in Leicester. Could we now, 500 years later, find and identify his remains? Before the project began, we knew that Richard was killed at the Battle of Bosworth, brought back to Leicester, and buried in the choir of the Church of the Greyfriars. But since this time, the precise location of his grave was lost, as the friary had been demolished. We know that he was aged 32 when he died, and that in a contemporary source, he was described as having one shoulder higher than the other. Like any missing persons case, the conclusion as to the identity of the individual whose remains have been found must be based on all the strands of evidence coming together from the various disciplines. Some of which I think might be weapon related. The combination of historical evidence and the skill of archaeologists with decades of experience of working in Leicester led to a sound plan for the excavation and the complex archaeology being interpreted so quickly when the Friary buildings were found. The examination of what came to be known as Skeleton One, recovered from the choir of the church, involved experts in the fields of osteology, forensic pathology and forensic engineering, shedding light on the nature of the curvature of the spine and the wounds found on the remains. Radiocarbon and stable isotope experts carried out analysis of the diet and dated Skeleton One to the right period. Genealogical research led to the discovery of people related to Richard III in particular ways, which meant that they could act as comparators for DNA analysis, and a DNA match was found. So, we have found the remains of a youngish male from the right period, with multiple battle injuries, severe scoliosis of the spine in the choir of the Church of the Greyfriars, with a DNA match with known relatives. Bayesian analysis was then used to collate all of the evidence to put a statistical number on how likely it was that the remains were Richard's. This showed that there was a 99.999% probability, at its most conservative, that these were the remains of Richard III. Sound is all around us. Of all the sounds that we make or hear, human speech is one of the most important in daily life. As well as speech, the noise we hear is all part of our environment. Be it a buzzing city or a relaxing countryside. Sound also conveys emotions, such as in a piece of music. Let's discover now how audio technology can help us to interact with the rich three-dimensional soundscape all around us. 
Although what we hear is a complex mixture of sound sources, we are able, without much effort, to extract meaningful information. We sometimes take this wonderful ability for granted, but to really understand how we hear, we need to understand first what sound is. Sound is composed of acoustic pressure waves that propagate through the air. The frequency of these sound waves determines the pitch of the sound, and the amplitude of the sound waves determines the loudness. The sound waves are reflected by surfaces, such as the walls or ceiling in a room, and these reflections are perceived as reverberation. After reaching our ear, sound waves are sensed by a biomechanical transducer in the outer and middle ear, and then our inner ear transforms this input into electrical signals, which are transmitted to the brain. And that's the most amazing part. The human brain has quite astonishing abilities that allow us to process signals received at our two ears in order to recognise voices, words and acoustic events and to determine the location of sound sources in the room around us. Still, when noise and reverberation are present, speech intelligibility and speech quality may be degraded. In our research, we derive mathematical models of speech, noise and reverberation and use these models to develop signal processing and machine learning technology that can improve the operational performance of a wide range of devices that we use every day, such as phones, laptops or aids for the hearing impaired. As current mobile devices and computers do not have the highly developed cognitive abilities of the human brain, researchers can compensate to some extent by equipping these devices with not just two, but actually many more microphones instead. The number of microphones can be tens or hundreds in some prototype systems, such as this spherical microphone array, or even in robots, so that the robot can hear better in real-world situations. Some of the techniques that we research combine the signals from the individual microphones in a way so as to select the sound coming from just a specific direction. And this type of spatial processing is what we refer to as beamforming. With it, we can create acoustic zoom so that one could listen to a sound source far away and hear it as if it were much closer. In order to interact in an intuitive way with a wide range of devices, including robots, computers, TVs and phones, we want these devices to understand our speech. This kind of machine hearing process is known as automatic speech recognition. Our research aims to develop technology to give our everyday devices the same level of awareness and understanding, or even superhuman capabilities. Using multiple microphones is of key importance in our research. This helps machines to learn awareness of the soundscape in three dimensions and enables people and machines to interact with sound in a 3D world.